please turn in your Bibles again to Matthew chapter 5. And as you turn there, I want to ask you this very important question. Who are you? Who are you? As we approach the new year, there are doubtless scores of people who have made it one of their goals, one of their resolutions for the coming year to be, just be, themselves. This year, I just want to be myself. Or maybe I want to find myself, discover who I really am. Uh, Some people are no doubt making resolutions to change themselves, to come out of all this uh, quarantine, a new person, ready to take on the world. One of the big difficulties in this whole philosophy of identity and the importance of the self is that we tend to, to think that we can make ourselves be whoever we want to be. But we can't make ourselves be anything because we are not our maker. We are not our designer. We are not our own master. And often the motive behind these desires to change or to change our view of ourselves, whether we like or dislike, the end goal is to feel comfortable with who we are, to be comfortable in our own skin, right? And the world clamors for either a change in perspective, uh, to get to the point where I'd be satisfied with who I am presently, or a change in appearance, or a change in attitude, a change in skill levels, success, wealth, a weight is one of the big goals every year. Uh, whatever the goals might be for change, ultimately what people want in the end is to be satisfied with themselves, to be proud of who they are, proud of what they've become, proud of what they have made themselves to be, regardless of what anyone else thinks. And they just want to be comfortable with who they are. Christian, who are you? Or even a better question, whose are you? And remembering that you've been bought with the price of Christ's sacrificial death, knowing whose you are, who are you becoming? Who are you becoming? What is your maker, your designer, your redeemer, your master? What is he in the process of conforming you to become? And the answer is, into the perfect image of Jesus Christ, perfect righteousness. And then, with all that being said, are are you comfortable with that? Are you comfortable with relinquishing control of the results? Not being in charge of the outcome? Not being able to take the credit for your improvements? Are you able, am I able, to rest in the care of another? even when the other is God himself. Christian, who are you? And who are you becoming? Let's take a minute and look back at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount thus far uh, to help us answer these questions. Go back up to verse 3. And I'm just going to look at these verses and read the the characteristic here. Verse 3 was poor in spirit. uh, One who was made aware of their sinful condition. Verse 4, those who mourn. This is our right response to our sin before a holy God. Verse 5, the meek, we are submitted, happily submitted to the Lord our God. Uh, Verse 6, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. When we're comfortable with the idea of submission to our almighty holy God, we even enjoy what he is making us to be, uh, which instills in us a desire Uh, to pursue righteousness, to pursue Christ-likeness. Verse 7, the merciful. Having experienced the mercy of God, we extend mercy to others. Verse 8, the pure in heart. The praise of man brings less and less comfort to our hearts, and the pleasure of God brings greater and greater joy. We know who God has made us to be, and we are happy in him. So the allure of the world doesn't charm us like it once did. The pure in heart. Uh, Verse 9, the peacemakers. Because our father is a peacemaker, we act like our dad and become peacemakers too. Verse 10, the reviled. 
and persecuted. Because our Savior was reviled, we act like our Savior and get reviled as well. I know this, though. This isn't the only response we get for being who we are and who we're becoming. Verse 16 tells us stuff in today's passage that, that others will see us being who we are and will glorify God. Some will revile us. Others will be changed, just like we were and like we are. It's so easy for us to look at this list from verses 3 through 12 in Matthew 5, maybe especially this time of year, and jump right into the attitude of, okay, all right, all right, I see this list. This is what I'm supposed to be like, okay, great, all right, let's see. Which one should I start working on first? Uh, Meekness, okay, meekness. Man, by the end of 2021, I'm going to be so meek. Here's how I'm going to do it. List, 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 list. But that's not what this is for. That's not what this list is for. Jesus isn't giving us a task list. He is telling us who we are or what we're becoming, what we will become entirely by the grace of God. This isn't our task list. If anything, it's his. And this sense of identity, this sense of not self-made, but God-given purpose, it carries right on into our main passage for today with the first phrases of verses 13 and verse 14. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Notice these statements do not say, be more salty, be more bright. These verses are not commands, though they do give us a purpose. These verses are not commands, they are declarative statements. And not become salt, but you are the salt. Not turn on the light, but you are the light. Christian, who are you? You are salt. You are light. And as you grow in meekness, a hungering and thirsting for righteousness, your saltiness and your brightness are only going to grow stronger and brighter. So the question for application becomes less, do better. And more, are you comfortable with this? Are you comfortable in the skin God has given you? Are you proud in the good sense of who your father is, children of God? especially when other people catch you acting like him. Maybe some of us saw uh, parents, some adults saw their parents this week, and maybe some of your kids caught you acting like your mom or like your dad from time to time. Children of God, do we act like our dad sometimes? (laughs) Are you submitted to his will? Are you at rest in his hands? I think some resolutions I might make from year to year to year to year that never seem to happen. Do you have any of those? Maybe, just maybe, I would be more successful in seeing change in those areas if instead of trying to just get better at those things, I would just submit to God's authority in them and just obey God. Grow in meekness by being submissive, which will result in following him, obeying him. Now, knowing that this is God's will and and purpose for our lives, what Christ is saying to us in this passage, let's take a closer look at these verses uh, to see what it's supposed to look like. Starting in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So let's talk about salt Uh, to help us understand Jesus' illustration here. In the ancient world, salt was harvested from salt marshes rather than uh, from evaporated water. Therefore, still it contained all of the impurities. And and it wasn't that the salt wasn't there. The salt didn't cease to be or just disappear altogether in that rocky substance. A salt doesn't stop being salt. It's just that there was more not salt, different minerals in that pile of salt than the actual salt. That's what happened. Uh, The different minerals adhered to the salt. 
uh, which made it lose its taste. It made the whole substance lose its saltiness and therefore its ability to preserve. It just didn't work like it should have. Also, the, the use of salt Jesus is referring to here is it's not quite like how we might use salt at our dinner tables. This is not salting uh, your food just to make them more savory or more tasty. This use of salt is, is a use uh, to be a preservative. A preservative. Instead of throwing their meat in the fridge or in the freezer like we can to keep it good longer, they would rub salt into it to keep it from more speedily rotting, decaying, uh, putrefying. Salt was being used as a preservative. And even with the salt, right, we put something in the fridge for a long time, it's going to go bad eventually. Even with the salt, the meat is going to go bad, salt or no salt. But the salt would prevent the meat from going bad as fast as it would without the salt. And there's some things that we can pull from this illustration that can be a help to us. Jesus is not commanding us here to keep everyone in the world in line. This is not Jesus saying to us, so you better go around and be everybody's police. Go make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. Keep everybody in line. Snap them into shape. We are not the righteousness police (laughs) demanding that lost people act like saved people without being saved, without even sharing the gospel with them. Uh, The slang use of salty today means to be angry or to be hostile toward people, even annoyed with them. Jesus is not calling us to be that kind of salty when people aren't doing right by our standards for sure, but even his. Being salty doesn't mean that we get to watch the news or read social media and respond with a, can you believe these people? Kind of an attitude. Instead, what we're being taught here is that As we live in purity, as we live our lives in purity, growing in Christ-likeness, as we grow in the characteristics of the Beatitudes from verses 3 through 12, one of the byproducts of our being who we are will be that the world around us takes notice and, in a sense, sits up straight when we come around. Just do. When a Christian shows up in a group of people, the cuss words might decrease, right? The crude jokes get less funny and less frequent. When an honest, hard-working employee arrives at work, it can drive others to do their work well. When a Christian's doing the accounting, people will know not to mess with the numbers. When a Christian is approving parts and manufacturing, the, the inspectors, they know to give accurate numbers and their measurements. You get the idea? Salt. Uh, We aren't commanded here to make everyone comply with our list of do's and don'ts. Instead, when we humbly walk the walk and not just talk the talk, it has a preservative effect on the world around us. And not because we're verbally demanding it from them. Not because we hold the right doctrinal statement. But because our lives and pure conduct Simply call for it. Uh, This serves as an encouragement to us to pursue purity. Pursue purity. Remember, the salt has lost its saltiness in Jesus' illustration. It's not ceased to be salt. Once God grabs a hold of you, he's not going to let anything pluck you out of his hand. The salt doesn't cease to be salt. Instead, it is salt that is surrounded by and attached to other foreign minerals that have rendered it ineffective. And this world is full of information being thrown at us all the time. People trying to influence others one way or another. There is a battle going on for our minds, isn't there? And we have to take a big step back and ask ourselves, am I being influenced most by the truth of God's word or by the ideas of the world? And the answer to that question will be what makes up the pile of minerals that we take on in this illustration. What am I listening to? What am I reading? What am I watching? Who am I listening to and trying to please? And and when I do hear, when I do see, when I do interact, am I sifting God's word through the world's ideas 
Or am I sifting the world's ideas through God's word? Which is the standard by which I measure the other? Who's in control? Who is steering my thinking? Who is shaping me? If it's the world, I'm going to lose my saltiness and become more like the decaying meat than like the salt. If it's God's word, if it's the truth, I will have a preservative effect on the people around me. I just will. And now what about light? Verse 14 says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Uh, The cities in the area at that time were built on higher elevations uh, for defense purposes. The builders of the cities would have, uh, the, they would have the advantage if the city were to be attacked, being at the higher elevation. And that advantage also resulted in high visibility. They weren't hiding from anyone. They could be seen from all around. The cities were often built with a white limestone, so the sunlight in the daytime would bounce right off the walls, easy to see from all around. At night, when the lamps were burning, the higher elevation would make the city lights shine for all those who lived on the outskirts of the town. There was no hiding the city. Its builders, its makers, put it where they wanted it to be for a purpose, fully aware of its high visibility. Verse 14, Jesus said, Nor nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. How many of you turn on your lights at night so that you can trip over things and stub your toes as you feel your way through the house? Anybody? Well, no, of course not, right? Of course not. The whole point of turning on the lights is to see. To see. The only reason we use lampshades today is because the light that we make is too bright to look into. It'll hurt your eyes if you stare at it. So we have to soften it and we spread it out. But we didn't design light to help us see. We didn't make that. That's just what light does. We do design light fixtures. We make lights. We just call them lights, right? Turn on the lights. We design them to help us to see things the way we want to. Spotlights, floodlights, flashlights, you name it. But the point is to help us see what we would not be able to see In the darkness, we are putting the light to use. Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others. Put the light that you already are and are becoming to use so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And a couple things here. Number one, Uh, We might read this and and see that Jesus is telling us to let our light be seen by others. Let your good works be seen by others. And and remember that he also commanded us to not let our left hand know what our right hand is doing. Oh no. We're told in Matthew 6, the very next chapter, not to try to do righteous works in order to be seen by men. Is Jesus contradicting himself? Well, no. The difference is in the motive. The motive. The motive. To the person who is trying to make themselves look awesome and impress people. Look what I can do. Jesus says, don't brag. Don't show off. That isn't righteousness. We might even say that isn't shining light at all. But to the person who is reflecting the light of the one who calls himself, Jesus Christ, the light of the world, in order to point others to him, to Jesus. Uh, That's what we're shooting for. When we are living righteously submitted to Christ, people will see that. Not because we're trying to flaunt anything, but it's just, just because it's who we are. People will see that. That cannot be hidden for long. And in reality, in in our lifetime, remember Jesus is talking about these Pharisees here in Israel. And in our lifetime, in our place where we are, there, there might be some of us here who have experienced a time, or maybe you live in a neighborhood where your neighbors would be impressed that you came to church today. We might have that. But my guess is most of your neighbors don't care. 
<laughs> or maybe they're even a little bothered by it if they're paying attention. Even the Baptist church, ah. I, I think we, though, still live in that zone of you do your thing and I'll do mine. I'll stay out of your business if you stay out of my business kind of a thing. As long as you don't force your religion on me, you do whatever you want. That's more uh, our Midwestern sensibility. So it's hard to try to do righteous acts to impress people when no one around us is impressed by righteous acts. There's really no point in that. In a way that could be a blessing to us, a removal of that extra temptation, because if it's there, we'll be tempted by it. It's helpful to remember here as well that there are different results to being salt and light. In verse 16, we see the effect of other people uh, praising God, meaning they saw the light in us, in our lives. You know, we have also become peacemakers, and we share the gospel with them, and they have turned to and are worshiping God. They were converted. That's a result. But back in verse 11 and 12, they responded with reviling, with persecuting, slander. Remember, Jesus didn't pause that day on the hillside after verse 12, clear his throat, <clears throat> and then say what the heading in my Bible is, salt and light, and then get started back up in verse 13. That's not how that went. This was one thought connected to the next, being spoken right after the other. So on both ends of this salt and light, there's persecution and there's conversion going on the different results of our living, of our being salt and light. The Christian who is and who is becoming a displayer of these characteristics, these beatitudes, is going to be salt and light. And the world around us will be preserved in ways through that, and some will respond with different forms and different severities of persecution. Others will respond in repentance, conversion, and worship becoming salt and light themselves. That part's up to God, isn't it? Uh, there's all kinds of things that have been said uh, that have been written about being salt and light. A pretty popular topic. Uh, but the big idea here, the big ideas are, are being used as a preservative in the world and being used as illuminators in this world. As salt, we slow down corruption. As light, we are used to eliminate that corruption in the lives of those who see the truth of the gospel and repent, passing from death to life, uh, from corruption to incorruption. Does that make sense? So salt is kind of like a negative uh, sense of keeping things from being as bad as they could be. And then the light is the positive of showing people the way, the truth, and the life, and by God's grace, seeing them converted. Now, those are the truths that are unique to each illustration, but there are some uh, more helpful things to, to consider that we can find in both of these ideas, both in being salt and in being light. And the first is this. It is super, super helpful and super important that we know and remember that the you, you, Y-O-U in verses 13 and 14 are both plural, plural. Jesus wasn't talking to you or just to you or just to you. Jesus is referring to you as in y'all or you guys, okay, if you're from the UP. Now, I think we should apply this in two different ways. Uh, one, please remember that your fight for purity your individual fight for purity to live as salt or your fight for brightness to point people to Jesus is not your individual fight. It is not something you're supposed to fight for alone. God has given us the local church of which you are a part, if you're a member of this church, to sharpen each other, to encourage one another, to refine our saltiness, to keep the oil burning in our lamps or in modern day technology to help you stay plugged in to the power source, the outlet of God's word through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and in prayer together and for each other. This work of preservation, this work of illumination is not something you equip yourself to do. 
So let's build each other up for this life as we live in Christ, united together. So that even, even when we are all alone at the job site, even when we are all alone at the schoolhouse, we know that we have a family who is rooting for us, praying for us, eager to meet together again to prepare for the next opportunities that we have to serve the Lord, to be salt and light. We all work together to prepare each other individually for these purposes that God gave us. And then secondly, our saltiness and our brightness is not just an individual task. It's not something we get together for to do on our own. We as a church are salt. We as a church are light in our community. Our identity is not just our identity. We have an identity as the First Baptist Church. What any one of us does and is, is a part of the whole. Uh, When any one of us takes on other minerals and loses our effectiveness, we all lose effectiveness. When any of us burns brightly for Jesus, we all burn more brightly. The church, we're all in this together. And the church, the local church, is God's embassy for his kingdom people in this foreign land. And it's God's lighthouse to the world, the lost who are out in darkness. So it's important for us to remember that the yous are plural. And then, it's also very important for us to understand that our difference from the world is what makes us recognizable. It is our difference from the world that makes us effective. There, there are more books, articles, training videos, whatever out there on ministry effectiveness and ministry tactics, it seems, uh, more than we could count. And, and one methodology to doing church or doing ministry that has been very prevalent, as you well know, is the idea of being as much like the world as we can in order to draw them in. But if we run that ministry philosophy through the grid of this passage, it it just doesn't work. It's, It's not what Jesus just said. Jesus is telling us, if we lose our saltiness, we become ineffective, not more effective. Church, we must remember, we are the salt. The world is the decaying meat. It's rotting. We should not want to become rotting meat. We cannot keep meat from decaying by introducing more decay. Church, we are light. The world, then, is darkness. See, see, both the church and the world are defined in this passage. We are light. The world is darkness. We do not become darkness to illuminate darkness. That's not how that works. It simply doesn't work that way. Even when the world comes up with their renaissances and the enlightenments, proud in its accomplishments, proud in its superior thinking and intellect, It only drives itself deeper into darkness, thinking that it has discovered everything it can discover. Proud of their own selves. And further, rejecting God. Do we not see that in our culture today? Moving towards atheism is not growth. (laughs) It's utter darkness. And so if all we are is another way for the world to keep being the world, if that's what we're becoming, if we're trying to allure them by being them, if all we are is another way for the world to keep being the world, then why would the world even be interested? They're already doing that and doing it well. That's their thing. We shouldn't be teaching them how to do their thing. They teach us how to do theirs. When we try to do it, we look like fish out of water. We look silly. Because we're supposed to be different. I saw an article just a few weeks ago about a a mega church on the east coast of the country. The pastor was caught in sin and and was removed from the position. And a secular uh, news publication, an unbelieving writer, concluded their piece on it 
by asking the question, why are these churches trying to be like us? We already are the way we are. This is an unbelieving person. Getting the fact that if, if there was something to be allured by, something to be drawn to, it ought to be different than what they already have. God has set us apart. We are in the world, but we are not of it. Instead, it is when we are salty in the good way. It is when we are salty, it is when we are light that we are effective. When we are shining, when we are illuminating Christ, the world sees him and responds. And the pushback might be the verse from 1 Corinthians in chapter 9. And Paul said, I have become all things to all people that by all means or by any means I might save some. That's the verse that's used, right? And people use that verse to defend the idea of becoming worldly in order to win the world. But but Paul was not talking about being worldly in 1 Corinthians 9. He was talking about giving up his rights to win the lost. If a religious Jew, a lost religious Jew, was offended by a Gentile practice, Paul wouldn't flaunt that freedom. He would willingly give up his freedom, remove that obstacle, even though it wasn't right, so that he might be able to share the gospel with that person. Paul was not taking liberties to win people. He was restricting his liberties around the religious lost to win them. And now because this is how we, we can get caught up sometimes, we all say, well, yeah, we can get caught up in this. And because, uh, because I was a worship leader for about 12 years in different churches, had a front row seat to some of this kind of stuff, be careful not to hear what I've just said in all of this and, and feel vindicated for not approving of any Christian music that simply isn't your cup of tea. You gotta be careful of that. And on the other hand, writing music or painting walls or wearing clothes for the purpose of maybe making people think that we are hip and cool and with it. And I said it that way because I can't say those things and sound cool. I just can't. I'm not that person. Sorry. But all that kind of stuff. If we're doing it for the purpose of trying to convince people that we are cool, that isn't effective. And everyone lost or saved can smell that from a mile away. We end up to, if we do those things, we end up just thinking that we're doing something pretty awesome when in reality the world looks at us and goes, really? <laughs> we need to be who we are. Be who you are. And simply love people. The world doesn't need to, need to see us trying to act like them. The world needs to see us loving them. Even when they're not just like us. Even if when they got saved, they might make our church look a little different. Uh, but as far as music goes, or even things like carpet or chairs or pews, uh, coffee or no coffee, suits or jeans, it, it's not necessarily wrong to have preferences in those things. But what we can do is, if we're not careful, is make one style the spiritual style, and the other is the non-spiritual style. And that can go both ways. There are people on the other side of whatever argument that might be out there who think that you're the one who's not spiritual because you're not doing what they're doing. And too often that spiritual style just happens to be the one that was most popular in our heyday. Uh, Did you know there was a time when pianos were considered vulgar instruments in the church? How dare you bring a piano in this auditorium or in this sanctuary? Listen, it isn't the style of music or any... uh, using certain kinds of instruments that makes us more or less like the world. It's when we have our own favorite style, our own personal taste and preferences, and demand that we get our way. Demand that we get what we like most. If others are going to be graced with our participation. That's when the church is most like the world, regardless of the style. And that can take the form of new music or old music. That can go both ways. And that, when we are putting that aside, that is when we rightly apply 1 Corinthians 9. I might like this kind of music or that kind of paint color or these kinds of clothes, 
but I am willing to give up my preference for the greater good of the whole. When we are like that, that's salty. That's illuminating. And then last but not least, we must understand that God has made us to be influencers. <laughs> influencers. Uh, the, world, the word influencer, it's changing in its meaning slightly in our day uh, due to its use in social media. But in a way that might be helpful for us as we think through this passage. An influencer today is a person who has a bunch of followers on social media. And who is then, because they have all those followers, all those eyeballs looking at their stuff, they are paid by various companies to make videos or take pictures with their products. It's product placement. So an athlete might take a picture drinking uh, Gatorade. And by the way, nobody's paying me to use these, uh, these brands in the sermon today, okay? The athlete might be paid to drink some Gatorade and have a picture of him taken. Uh, or maybe to wear Nikes for his workout and take a picture of his workout. Uh, some popular person might take pics of their, their trip to a certain hotel or to a resort. Of course, all expenses paid so that they would take pics and post it to their social media. You get the idea? They are being watched by a bunch of people, kind of like mindlessly scrolling, 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 scrolling through all their stuff, being watched by these people who, who want to see what they're up to and, and maybe a little bit live vicariously through them. Wish they were as cool, as beautiful, as talented as them. Sort of wish they could get paid to do the same kind of things and try to start out on their own and get as many followers as they can and hope that they can become an influencer. They do all of this stuff with these thousands or even millions of adoring worshipers, I, I mean followers. And the companies that pay them all hope that those followers also buy those products as a result having been influenced through social media. Well, Christians, God has not called us to be influenced. God has not called us to be influenced. God has called us to be influencers. Except that we're not marketing just some product. We're <laughs> not just marketing a product. To say that we're influencers marketing a, a great product would be a gross understatement. Instead, we are pointing people to the almighty God, the God of the universe, the one who holds all things together, everything being created by him and for him. We are pointing people to the one who took on flesh, lived a perfect and sinless life, and died in the place of sinners, taking our penalty on himself so that we could be made right with God. We are not trying to trick people into buying a product that may or may not make them happy. We are representing the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Their only hope of salvation. The one who will judge all things judgely with all, justly with all righteousness. He will judge all things justly with all righteousness. The one who will make the heavens pass away with a roar, who uh, will burn up and dissolve the heavenly bodies and expose every work that was done on earth, Second Peter 3. We are pointing people to the one who will see death and hell cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. The one who will make the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and will forever dwell with his people. The very people who today are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Church, whose are you? Who are you? Praise God for the ways he has used us for his glory in the past. And by God's grace, may 2021 be a great year of preservation and of illumination through the life and ministry of the First Baptist Church in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And our brothers and sisters across town, around town, and the church around the world. May God be glorified through us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for this calling. 
God, I think when we, when we look at ourselves and by your grace see ourselves honestly in truth, in the context of the world around us, we see the self-help uh, mantras and the uh, desire to make ourselves better, that we have this ability, this power, and we confuse we confuse the idea of growing in Christ-likeness uh, with something that some inspirational speaker would try to push people to become on whatever New York Times bestseller list, and we marry the two. God, forgive us, even for thinking about spiritual growth in a carnal way. May we truly be just simply submitted to you, growing in meekness, desiring to see you, to behold your face, to know who you are, to know who we are. And in that knowledge and in that growth that you're accomplishing in us by your grace, God, we thank you that you've made us salt and light. God, use us to influence people. I pray that we would be used as preservation. God, may we live in such a way, may we carry ourselves uh, like Jesus. May we think biblically, speak biblically, a desire to be pleasing to you no matter who we're with and we're around in such a way that other people take notice and know that they've seen and experienced something that isn't of this world and that they would call them to attention. And God, even more than that, more than just preservation and, and seeing people sit up straight, as it were, God, I pray that you would use us, use our lives, use our words as peacemakers uh, to draw lost souls to yourself. God, use us, we pray, to reach the lost for Christ. Uh, may this church truly be a lighthouse in this community as we love people, as we love you, as we tell them of Christ and his sacrifice for our sins. God, may we be salty and have much saltiness and be very effective. God, may the light that you have put in us shine very brightly that you may be glorified through us and through those that you would draw to yourself through us. And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.